I will get started and I will try to go through this relatively quickly for you guys. And I think this is going to tie nicely into what Austin was talking about, right? Because he talked about a lot of these new drugs for gram negative resistance. And a lot of them are beta lactam, beta lactam, beta lactamase um, drugs that, you know, when patients have allergies become really, really difficult to manage. Um, this is a pretty big topic. I'm going to just focus on beta lactam allergies, but I think a lot of the principles will apply to any sort of allergy that you deal with um, in the anti antimicrobial realm, you know, antibiotic or otherwise. So I have nothing to disclose um, and we're just going to dive right in. So how many of you guys have gone into a chart? And this is a screenshot from the VA's um, electronic health record, but seen something along this line where it just says penicillin, your nature of your reaction is um, is unknown, right? So it just tells you absolutely nothing. And here in our system, it tells you if it's observed or historical. So it's historical. We have no idea what a, what the patient's allergy looks like, right? You just have absolutely no clue and nothing to go on other than that this patient is allergic to penicillin. It could be not even an allergy. It could be, you know, an ADR where the patient says, you know, oh, it just causes an upset stomach, or it could be a true, you know, IgE mediated anaphylactic type reaction. And you just have no idea when you're looking in the chart alone. You know, I've had my favorite one. I had an allergy that looked like this and I actually interviewed the patient and the patient told me that she had five siblings and Two of her five siblings were allergic to penicillin, but their mom couldn't remember which two, so she just labeled all five kids allergic. So some of them are just not even real, period. Um, so, you know, just consider, you know, when you see something like that and you're seeing a patient that needs to be treated for syphilis, this is going to be a big problem for you. Um, when you've got a patient that is now receiving a fluoroquinolone instead of a beta-lactam and then develops C. diff, big problem again. Um, you know, you've got a patient that needs orthopedic surgery, but instead of getting cefazolin, gets vancomycin and now has a surgical site infection. And there was actually a study, this is back in 2017, that actually, you know, showed the serious impact of reported penicillin allergies on surgical site infections. And surgical site infections actually had a 79% higher mortality in in patients that received vanco over cefazolin so definitely you know poor outcomes can happen with this for sure you've also got patients that have mssa bacteremia or pneumonias that are getting vancomycin instead of cefazolin and the harsh reality is that these patients die you know mortality rate also super high 80 percent in patients that don't get first line therapy for mssa bacteremias um, and that was shown in this study here, if anybody's interested. This is back from 2011. So this is not recent data. This is stuff we've known for a very, very long time. And last but not least, you know, you've got patients that get admitted for pneumonia, have beta-lactam allergies, and just get started on as trianam, and it turns out to be a completely resistant um, infection. And based on our local antibiogram at the Tampa VA, which may be applicable to other sites as well, um, Astrium NAM only has a 50% 50, 50 susceptibility rate for pseudomonal infection. So definitely, you know, not, not the best drug to be using for patients that have serious infections um, when you might be able to just get a better allergy history to help you out here. So, you know, what, what I want all of you guys to imagine is let's say that you open up a chart and you see this instead. You know, you've got a patient that now has urticaria documented and you have like a whole novel down here at the bottom that actually talks about, you know, the patient um, who was 17 years old. And, you know, so this is over 50 years ago and he was given an IM injection of penicillin and immediately following that developed what he described as small red bumps presumably hives all over his arms and feet. And then since that initial reaction, we know that he's tolerated Keflex or Cephalexin, Ceftriaxone, and Cefepime without reaction. So this is definitely a lot more helpful. So it didn't remove the allergy or anything, but it does help us be able to guide what, what beta-lactams we can use. Because when you have a penicillin allergy that just absolutely says nothing, it almost knocks out your entire beta-lactam class. And that is very, very, you know, it has very poor outcomes and we don't want that to happen. So, you know, just a little bit of additional information. There's a couple more studies to talk about, you know, 
in terms of allergy documentation in general, I just showed, showed you some examples here. So I showed you a bad, a poor example at Tampa and a good example in Tampa. But, you know, data says that about 30% of patient charts have absolutely no allergy documentation in them. So, you know, more than 30% of the time when you go in the chart, you're not going to have information. Um, in 2008, there was a second study by Ishmael and colleagues that showed that 24.7% of patients, and this was actually surgical patients, had, you know, charts had no allergy documentation as well. And then last but not least, of the ones that do get documented, only about 0.6% of those actually are fully and accurately documented in the electronic health record. So this is a huge, huge area of improvement. And so I bring this up because I know that all of you guys are doing a really awesome job getting allergy information from patients, but the charts still, you know, have poor documentation. So one of the things that we can do as practitioners, whether you're a pharmacist, physician, fellow, doesn't matter, um, is updating the allergy, not just in your notes, but actually in the chart. So go into the allergy section and actually add those additional comments when you talk to a patient. Um, and it can really, really change outcomes and help you the next time you have to see that patient. Other things, beta-lactam allergies, I showed you on the first slide some mortality issues, but, you know, they're also linked to increased antimicrobial resistance, increased use of broad-spectrum antimicrobials, the use of less efficacious antimicrobials, increased hospital length of stay, decreased guideline compliance because you just can't use them, and increased healthcare costs. So this is a really, really huge area that we can make improvements on. And I've kind of hinted at this a little bit before, but about 10% of the population actually reports that they're allergic to penicillin, but less than 1% of those, those are actually truly allergic. So this means 90% of these are completely erroneous, meaning drug intolerances, side effects, unknown reactions, or like my story about the mom who labeled all of her kids because she wasn't sure which ones were allergic. The other really cool thing about beta-lactam allergies, which is actually different than some other allergies, out there is that hypersensitivity can actually decrease with time. So the average studies say that about 50% of patients lose their sensitivity by five years. That goes up to 80% at 10 years, and it continues to get higher and higher than that further out. So especially in our veteran population, you have patients that you know, are 50 plus years out from their allergy. So they may not, they may have truly been allergic at one point in time, but that sensitivity may have been lost. So really what I want to hone in really quick just to die, start the presentation is what can you do about this? And I think I've kind of said this a couple times already, but ensure complete assessment of allergies. I know you guys are already doing this, but just make sure that you go in there and document that allergy information in your allergy and ADR package. And I know that all three of our sites, so Tampa, um, Moffitt, and TGH all have a different health record. So if you need help figuring out how to update it, you know, always please reach out to your pharmacist or um other physicians to see how to do that. And if you're, if the hospital that you're at allows it, um, Tampa VA does, you know, you can always place an outpatient allergy consult to actually get further assessment and penicillin skin testing. This is a huge push that we've been doing locally in Tampa. We actually have a pharmacy student that interviews patients that are admitted with penicillin allergies and consults them to our allergy clinic. We unfortunately aren't able to do inpatient skin testing at this time, at the VA. However, you know, that is a, a long-term goal, but for now we are able to at least refer them to allergy for consultation after discharge. So if we talk about the different types of reactions, um, hypersensitivity reactions you can have to beta-lactams, um, there's two different things. You can have just plain old adverse drug reactions and allergies, and we're going to focus um, the rest of this section on allergies themselves. So allergic reactions are abnormal reactions um, of your immune system to a medication. The most common causes being antibiotics, so beta-lactams. Anticonvulsants are also a huge um, class of drugs that cause allergic reactions. Chemotherapy is up there, and then monoclonal antibody therapy as well. Um, and then NSAIDs can be, is probably the next highest class. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. And there are two types of allergic reactions, you can have type A reactions. Sorry guys, um, which are dose dependent and non-immune mediated. And then you can have type B reactions, which are dose independent. And these are the immune mediated that we're gonna focus on. So here are your 
Bloom's classifications um, of your hypersensitivity reactions. So you have your class one, class two, class three, class four, and these are your different hypersensitivity reactions. And this table is pretty busy, um, but I just want to highlight here the difference. So your class one reactions are things that um, you probably think of. So these are your type one IgE mediated reactions. This is the most common allergy you're going to see. Puritis, urticaria, angioedema, bronchospasm, anaphylaxis. Those are the type of symptoms you're thinking of. These are the type of reactions that, like I said, are most common, but these are also the ones that penicillin skin testing are effective for. Anything outside of this, a skin test is really not going to help you. Patients can have class two reactions, which are more of your hemolytic abnormalities. So hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia. Class three tends to be kind of like your serum sickness type picture. And then class four are your um, delayed reactions. So these are things like dress, um, TEN, um, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, things like that. And these are the type of reactions, especially your type 4 delayed hypersensitivity reactions, that you would never, ever, ever want to expose a patient to these drugs again um, if they do experience this reaction. So, you know, being able to identify what truly, truly happens in these patients is really important because it can determine whether or not you can re-challenge them, skin test them, or do something different. So looking at some different um, types of reactions, so the first one is exanthemous drug eruptions, um, which account for about 80% of drug rashes. They usually appear anywhere from 4 to 21 days after initiation of therapy, and they can be described in the chart as maculopapular or morbilliform eruptions. The clinical presentation tends to be widespread, symmetrical rashes. There are pink or red papules that occur without blistering, um, and some patients may experience like low-grade fevers with these. And the duration of the rash um, really depends on the half-life of the drug, and it can take weeks to um, improve, and I'll tell you, maybe TMI, but I just recently had a reaction that looked just like this to a beta-lactam. So, um, I mean, those are not pictures of me, but they could be because that's exactly what it looked like. So, um, and it took me, it appeared about seven days after my initiation of therapy. So it looked right, it was right in this window and it was, it took about two weeks to fully resolve. So it does um, take a long time to happen. Um, the second type of reaction people can experience is like urticaria or hives. Um, so here's some images of what it looks like. These account for about five to 10% of drug rashes you'll see. Um, these are considered a type 1 um, hypersensitivity reaction. Most patients that experience these are, um, you know, asymptomatic and they may just notice the bumps, but some may complain of itching. Um, and then they may present with like central blanching or red rims, but they usually are very, very short lived. So usually last about less than 24 hours, especially if you um, stop exposure to the drug. If you continue to take it, it could last longer than that. But for the most part, um, these are short lived. Um, when we talk about a little bit more severe reactions, so severe cutaneous adverse reactions, these are more of your type 4 delayed hypersensitivity reactions. So these are ones that you really don't want to re-expose your patient to these drugs if you see anything like this. Um, so there's a bunch of different examples. Um, they're abbreviated SCARS. Um, it includes Stevens johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis, um, DRAS syndrome, or um, AGEP, which is acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis. If you look at Stevens Johnson's and toxic epidermal necrolysis, about 80% um, of these are drug related type reactions. Um, like your type 1 hypersensitivity reactions, they can occur, you know, 4 to 21 days after the first dose of the drug. Um, and they do have a high mortality rate. It can range anywhere from 10 to 40%. Um, the clinical presentation in these patients includes severe acute blistering. Um, a lot of patients will have mucous membrane involvement, so it's important to check like their nose, mouth, things like that when you're seeing a patient that may be experiencing this. A lot of them will have true fevers. They may have um, generalized malaise, weakness, um, fatigue, sore throat, difficulty swallowing, and some can even report dysuria. Um, if you look at dress, it looks a little bit different. Um, this one is a lot more delayed than Stevens Johnson's. It's at least 14 days after the first dose of medication. So these are also hard to catch, right? So they're a lot further out from these medications. So you may not even be following these patients when these happen. So um, it's important to check here. Um, big characteristic thing with these is a widespread widespread rash, facial edema, and erythema. Um, 
patients can have purpuric eruptions on the lower extremities. They may also have fever. And then characteristically on labs, they will have eosinophilia. So it's important to check that um, when you're suspecting something like this. Some may have lymphadenopathy and involvement of other organs. So, you know, in addition to checking for eosinophilia, you can also check, you know, your BMP, CNP, and just make sure that they're not having any other lab abnormalities like um, elevations in liver function tests or even, you know, issues with renal function. Because I think actually about 80% of the cases may be followed by kidney involvement, so it's important to watch renal function in these as well. And then the last one, acute generalized ex exanthematous pustulosis or AGEP. Um, it count, about 50% of these cases are drug group related. They can occur a little bit earlier um, in the course of drug exposure within the first 72 hours. Um, and patients usually present with non-follicular pustules or swollen skin. Um, it typically presents in body folds. So um, in the folds of the elbow, armpit, and behind the knees are the most common places. Um, patients will have facial edema. They can develop fever. You know, it's not not in all patients, and then these patients will have a leukocytosis with a neutrophilia on lab presentation. Um, and then to make things more complicated, patients can have non-drug rashes. So rashes can occur in any patients, um, and they can be very difficult to distinguish from um, drug-induced rashes. So um, it's very, very hard to tell, especially if you have a clinical picture that, you know, the patient may have a drug exposure, especially when you see, you know, 80% of things are caused by drugs. So these can be difficult to distinguish, so it's always helpful, um, you know, if you're having trouble with that or you have questionable suspicion, you know, you can always get like a dermatologist or an allergist involved to help um, diagnose these. But some alternative causes of rash um, that aren't drug, you know, measles or rubella can cause them. Um, infectious mononucleosis, especially in patients that have been prescribed penicillin, can actually cause a rash. Strep pharyngitis, acute graft-versus-host disease, HIV. Um, presents especially acute infection with uh, non-drug rash, um, viral infections, especially like Coxsackie virus or hand, foot, and mouth can cause um, non-drug rashes, and then lupus can also cause it. So there's definitely a lot of different things. It presents in a lot of different ways. So, you know, um, if you if you get to, to see it, it may help with the diagnosis, but a lot of times you are just having a patient telling you what happened. And so it may even be hard to distinguish because you may not have images with it. Um, but continuing on, I think the important thing with all that we've talked about is, you know, identifying the allergy is important and, you know, updating and getting a good history from the patient is also important. But really what it comes down to is you're not gonna, you may not have an answer right in the moment when you actually have to treat this patient. So. What I really want to talk about is how do we deal with beta-lactam allergy cross-reactivity? And so a little history lesson. Back in the 1970s, cephalosporins and penicillin cross-reactivity reports were, you know, anywhere from 10 to 25 percent, depending on the papers that you read. So, you know, back even when I went to pharmacy school, which was really not that long ago, um, we were always taught, oh, you know, cross-reactivity with penicillins, you never want to use a cephalosporin in a patient with a penicillin allergy because, you know, 25% of the time they will have a cross-reaction. And I was always taught that all the way through pharmacy school. Even though in the 1990s, we actually realized that the cephalosporin and penicillin cross-reactivity was found to be less than 1%. And those high rates of, of cross-reactivity up to 25% were actually due to poor um, drug manufacturing practices. So what was actually happening in a lot of um, plants that made antibiotics is they were making penicillins, like putting them in their capsules and tablets and making them on the table. And then right behind that, they were making their cephalosporins. So essentially your cephalosporins were laced with penicillins. That's why you were having 25% cross-reactivity when the true cross-reactivity is about less than, or is less than 1%. And a little bit later in the 1990s, it was actually confirmed that the cross-reactivity is not due to the beta-lactam ring in these agents. It's actually due to the R1 side chain, which really, really makes a huge difference as well. So 
When we look at the structure of your beta-lactam, so on the left-hand side, you have your beta-lactam ring, which is characteristic of all beta-lactams, and you can see the difference between your cephalosporin and penicillin structure. So cephalosporins tend to have, you know, a six-sided ring versus the five and the penicillins. But really, really what matters is this R1 side chain over here on the left-hand side. So when you look at penicillins to cephalosporins, you know, less than a one to two percent cross reactivity per this figure. When you look at um, carbapenems, it's even lower than that. So, you know, less than one percent to a half a percent of cross reactivity. And then when you look at your monobactams, which are your astreanam, there's absolutely no cross reactivity, which is why a lot of people, when you see penicillin allergies, the old adage is let's just give them astreanam because you're still giving them beta lactam, but there's no cross reactivity. So, you know, reviewing the evidence supporting the use of cephalosporins in patients with penicillin allergies, if you look at articles published as far back as 1970 or 1960 to 2007, um, there's now there's even more than this, but 44 studies were identified in this particular meta analysis that we looked at. And the literature really support the use of, of cephalosporins in patients that had um, penicillin allergies, except those that had type one or type four delayed hypersensitivity reactions. So this included your type two and three, so your hematologic malignancies, they said you might can try them. Um, but you know, there's also more data out there now, even since 2007 to support that you might can use them in type one immediate hypersensitivity reactions. But in patients that have those de delayed hypersensitivity reactions, such as Stevens-Johnson's, or those type syndromes, you know, you may want to be a little bit more cautious. I definitely would be. Um, and if you look a little bit further at this, um, in 1995, one of the studies that was included in that last meta analysis actually identified that it was that R1 side chain that caused the allergic reactions in up to 92% of the cases. Um, it's usually sitting in position six or seven in the actual structure. Um, and that is what the epitope was recognizing when creating antibodies and causing that massive immune response. And so just to highlight, here's the side chain. So I know those of you that, especially from a fellow side, or those of you that have rotated through the VA have probably seen this sheet um, before. Um, so this is actually our um, cross-reactivity table that we provide as part of our antimicrobial stewardship program and guidebook to help you identify if side chains are similar in patients or in the antibiotics when you're using them. So just to kind of orient you, so the X and Y axis are the same. So it's got the drug names at the top and on the side and basically what it is. Um, and so this is not in color. It's kind of like all in purple, but the lighter color, um, which is hard to tell, but here's a lighter box or there's some lighter boxes and I'll get you guys a color copy afterwards if you don't have a copy of this so you can have it. Um, but the, the lighter boxes actually are completely considered identical structures and then the darker boxes are um, R1 or R2 side chains that might be similar but different. But anything that is completely blank means that there is absolutely no cross reactivity. So let's do an example. Um, you've got a patient that has an allergy in the chart. It's just documented as rash to cefuroxime. And the question we want to answer is what beta-lactams do we need to avoid in this patient? So here is on your um, x-axis, I put the red box around cefuroxime. So we're going to look for the shaded boxes that are things that would have identical or very similar side chains that we don't want to use. So these are drugs like cefoxetin, cefixime, ceftriaxone, cefpodoxime, and cefepime. But if you wanted to try um, something different in these patients, you could. So first-generation cephalosporins actually don't have similar side chains. So depending on what you're trying to treat, you could you could go that route as well. And then on this chart, we do not include our carbapenems because they have such low cross-reactivity that it's usually safe. We consider it safe to use a carbapenem in a patient um, with a penicillin allergy. Um, so here's a second question for you guys. So a patient has a documented allergy to penicillin, but no reactions in the chart. Per chart review, you see the patient has tolerated cefepime several times in the past year. Which of the following beta-lactams um, um, might you now consider, you know, prior to interviewing the patient? And here's cefepime for you. 
Um, and I'll tell you that of these options, you know, in this case, it, we're just picking, but you can use um, nafcillin. You may want to avoid things like, um, you, since nafcillin is approved, you could use piperacillin. You could also use, um, you could also use cefazolin and ceftriaxone um, does have a similar side chain, so you may want to avoid that. So any of those other ones could be an option um, for the patient. So that's kind of how you would use this chart. Um, and I will tell you, I reference it probably once a day, especially when I'm on our consult service, because without fail, there's always a patient that has this. And sometimes you know what they've tried before, um, and you might feel more comfortable trying a third generation or something like that, even though they have similar side chains based on patients tolerating um, cephalosporins before. But, you know, it, it can... It can be difficult, but I think um, this chart really, really does help guide things, especially when you're in a tight bind and you really want to use a beta-lactam, but the patient really, you either can't get a history or you don't have um, access to skin testing or an allergist available. And then a little clor clinical pearl I know Austin mentioned, you know, the potential cross-reactivity with ceftazidime and ceft ceftolazone, um, but also there's um, cross-reactivity with azotrianam and ceftazidime. So if you have a patient that has a ceftazidime allergy, I definitely would avoid using um, azotrianam in these patients because the side chains are virtually identical. So I've hinted at this a little bit before, but, you know, if you can at some point, if you are able to refer a patient for allergy skin testing or get the opportunity during the course of your fellowship or maybe in some of your jobs to do allergy skin testing, that is an option for patients. So we'll talk about some of that. So penicillin skin testing is actually a two-step reagent-based procedure that involves a skin prick and an intradermal test. The full test takes about 45 to 60 minutes, and it does have a 99% negative predictive value, meaning that if you have a negative skin test, that, you know, 99% chance that you are no longer allergic to penicillin. And here in Tampa, when our allergy colleagues do the penicillin skin testing, they actually write a little blurb in the chart after the patient has a negative skin test that the patient is at no higher risk than the general population for developing a penicillin allergy, and they will remove the allergy from the chart based on this 99% negative predictive value. And that's already high enough skin test alone, but when you combine it with a graded challenge or an oral challenge, it's virtually 100% negative predictive value. And then Utilizing skin testing really does improve clinical out outcomes, reduces the use of a second line, more broad spectrum antimicrobials, and in the end reduces healthcare costs. So if you have the ability to do it within the hospital, I would definitely recommend it. It's an hour procedure and could really get the patient on first line therapy. Just uh, you may not always have access to that where you're at. I um, mean, this is just a kind of like a screenshot of exactly what goes into the skin test. So the first one is the skin prick where they will have a positive control with histamine, a negative control with saline, and then you use your major and minor determinants. And it's literally just a prick on the skin. So they just barely touch your skin to prick and see if there's no reaction. If there's no reaction, they use the same products again, except for the histamine, to do an intradermal test. So they do a negative control and then the major and minor disturbance, and they actually do an intradermal test. It looks very similar to like a um, one of those TB tests that goes just under the skin. They monitor for 15 minutes, and then if no response, then they go on to a graded or observed challenge, um, oral challenge, and give a low dose of amoxicillin or equivalent and monitor for about an hour after. So this identifies those immediate hypersensitivity reactions, but it can miss um, delayed hypersensitivity. So patients should always be counseled to call if they develop any rash or anything several days after uh, the test. Um, and so I kind of highlighted this. Uh, this is just further detail on the skin prick. And this is what it looks like. So you'll see the positive control should be positive. That's your histamine. Your negative control should be negative. And then your next spots are your major and minor determinants. And both of those are negative in this particular test. So this was a negative skin prick. When you go to the intradermal test, uh, like I said, it's going to be an intradermal right under the skin. You're going to monitor for 15 minutes. And a negative test is considered no wheel at all. 
Um, and if it's greater than five millimeters or three millimeters larger than the saline control, it is considered a positive test. So um, this image is actually a positive test. So you can see that at the bottom, that's your negative control. So you should have no reaction there, but you can see that the patient does have, you know, greater than five millimeter wheel um, where the intradermal test was taken for both the positive and, or the major and minor determinant. So just some pearls about skin testing. Um, it is not required to be done after before every single course. Once you do it one time, if it's negative, the patient is no longer considered allergic to penicillin, and you can go ahead and give them penicillin for the rest of their lives unless they have some resensitization to it, which can occur in less than 1% of patients, which is actually just the general risk of um, penicillin allergies. Um, and then you can have... Um, non-penicillin beta-lactam skin testing um, protocols, but they are less validated. So this means like cephalosporin testing and things like that just do not have the same negative predictive value. So they are not recommended um, as frequently as penicillin alone. Um, and so like I said, especially cephalosporin skin testing, um, you cannot say that because you're penicillin negative that you're also cephalosporin allergy negative. So they are not, um, they don't ac accurately reflect each other. And hopefully one day, you know, cephalosporin testing will step up to be as good as um, penicillin skin testing. Um, and like I said, so here's where we're at. The negative predictive value for cephalosporin skin testing is about 30%. Um, so definitely not near as good as penicillin allergies. So graded challenges, so this is kind of the last step of a skin test. Um, in, in certain patients, depending on what they report is their allergy, sometimes allergists will just go straight to the graded challenge. And so these are either patients who have negative skin test or um, is just eligible to start a graded challenge, you know, low risk. Um, and so um, it should be very patient specific. If you make it too cautious so that your doses are too low, um, you can actually, it can mimic desensitization and you can lead to tolerance. So it's a false, false negative. Um, and if it's too aggressive in a patient that is somewhat high risk, it can cause life threatening reactions. So it should be done very cautiously. And the negative predictive value of a graded challenge alone is 94%. Um, so these are um, examples of this is just an example of what a graded challenge um, might look like so if we look at amoxicillin i know this chart is small um here's how the doses look so i've kind of blown it up into a chart so you would start off with your target go dose is a thousand milligrams of amoxicillin and you start with one milligram and then 30 minutes later you get five milligrams then 25 100 then 500 and a thousand and you do that about every half hour and if they can tolerate they consider it to pass a graded challenge sometimes they'll just start with like a hundred milligram dose then do 250 then 500 so there are definitely multiple ways to do this but this is just an example of one graded challenge and then desensitization is different this is indicated for patients that require a beta-lactam antimicrobial in the setting of a true IgE mediated allergy. So this patient is truly, truly allergic, but you do not have an alternative and you have to give a penicillin. So the number one example of this is patients that, pregnant women that need penicillin for syphilis, you have to give them um, penicillin, so they do need desensitization. The purpose of this is to invoke a temporary state of unresponsiveness to the drug that causes the hypersensitivity. So basically you're tricking your body into not having hypersensitivity reaction. And this is different from a graded challenge um, because it is, uh, but it has some similarities. It's incremental administration of increasing doses. Um, so about 33% of patients can have hypersensitivity during the procedure because they are truly allergic, but you know, it's somewhere you know, there's a, a success rate usually of over greedy, greater than 60%. And it can be done IV or PO depending on your indication. And then um, patients, um, the tolerant state is lost at 24 to 36 hours after you discontinue the drug. So if you have a patient that's taking oral amoxicillin and they miss a dose, they could be resensitized. So it's really, really important to be compliant with this um, in patients that you're going to do it with. You have to desensitize every single time you have to expose these type of patients to 
to beta-lactam therapy. So here's an example of desensitization. So, so here are some of the pre-meds patients get Benadryl or hydroxazine prior to the protocol, famotidine, lorazepam, and dexamethasone to prevent any sort of um, discomfort or rashes, itching, chest tightness, or any of the pains that they may experience um, during the protocol. And this is what it looks like. So these are even smaller than penicillin, um, like the graded challenge. So you start out with, you know, 100 units per milligram, then 200, and you work your way up to a full dose. So it's definitely a very, very slow process. <laughs> and like I said, if you miss a single dose of this, um, they can be resensitized and you would have to start over. And so once you've either done a penicillin skin test or desensitized, you have to decide, do we need to delabel? If you desensitize a patient, you never, ever want to delabel their allergy. They are still allergic. You just made it. You just tricked your body into doing it this one time. If they have a negative skin test or oral challenge, you can delabel these patients, meaning you can remove the allergy from their chart. Um, but there are a lot of obstacles with this. Uh, you know, there can be miscommunication of results between healthcare specialties. So maybe, you know, the allergist knows the patient's not allergic, but this doesn't get communicated to other um, specialties. So some places still think they're allergic, some don't. So there's um, issues there. Patients may also misunderstand their res test results. So it's really, really important to educate a patient if you're going to delabel their allergy, because if they misunderstand the next time they come in, they can just tell you, oh, yeah, I'm allergic to penicillin. Can you put that on your chart? Um, and it can get re-added back in there. Um, the other issue is lack of documentation of test results, and I will tell you that um, we had this issue locally in Tampa a couple years back that, you know, we were getting negative skin tests. They were being actually documented in the notes, but we weren't actually delabeling. So, you know, we worked on our documentation procedures, and now um, we are virtually 100% of compliance of negative skin tests and delabeling those allergies. Um, and then just other issues is just passive chart recommendations. You know, sometimes people we'll be reading through the chart old notes and see that the patient was allergic to penicillin and it's not on their chart and it just gets passively added back in there thinking that you're doing the right thing. So um, this can definitely be the most challenging part of beta-lactam allergies. That's why documentation is important um, across the board and that's the best we can really do at this point. Um, so it's really, really important what, like I said, document and then share among all healthcare providers. So actively report to other providers um, and make sure to document multiple places in the EMR, hopefully, so that they don't get added. Um, one of the things we do at Tampa is I can see every VA of the country and where the allergies are. So we do a really, really good job communicating with each other to remove those remote allergies in someone that has a negative skin test. And then lastly, patients should receive clear instructions on um, the implement, implement, implication of their test results. So make sure they really, really do understand that they're negative, that they do not need to tell anybody that they're allergic to penicillin anymore. And it's actually recommended to give them sort of like a wallet card with their test results so that they can um, present it at, at different office appointments if anybody gives them a hard time. So with that, I'm just gonna wrap up. Um, so. The one thing I do want to highlight is I am the stewardship pharmacist at the Tampa VA, so I always like to tie in stewardship somewhere. And in the 2016 IDSA stewardship guidelines, um, allergy assessment and penicillin skin testing is actually a recommended inter um, intervention by IDSA and SHEA. So this is something if those of you, especially fellows, are planning to get stewardship jobs after you know, can you complete fellowship? This is something that you can really bring to a lot of sites because sites do not all have the ability to do this. And this is definitely a hot topic in stewardship. Um, and you can achieve this goal through, you know, just completing, you know, and trying to have better allergy assessments at your site, increasing documentation or access to skin testing. So those are some options. And then key take home points, you know, incorporate allergy assessments and updating your documentation into your daily practice. So when you're talking to patients about allergies, just make sure you document really, really well in the chart and update their allergies um, in the electronic health record when more information is obtained. Um, increase any increased access to allergy consults if you can, especially here in Tampa. Please feel free to put in an allergy consult at the time of discharge or when you sign off um, or if you're seeing people in the ambulatory care setting. And as always, don't hesitate to reach out to 
your antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist with questions about this. And these principles that we apply here, we talked about beta-lactam allergies, but anytime you have an allergy to a patient, you know, get a complete assessment, make sure it's updated, and really assess, you know, what happened in the patient and make use clinical judgment on whether or not what alternatives you have. So I think these take-home points can be applied anywhere. So with that, I am done. Does anybody have any questions for me?